Good to see everybody this morning. All right, I think I'm properly connected. Good to be with you. Um, good to see uh, your eyes and the smiles that are still visible um, through your eyes. So it's, it's good to make that, that connection. And good morning to um, all who are joining us from home. Glad that, that we can be together in this way as well. I um, want to begin just by saying Happy Father's Day. And um, uh, just pray that uh, today can be a, a day of, of joy and celebration. Um, and, and a day to honor your fathers and, and uh, enjoy time with them. Um, at the same time, we also know that, that holidays like this, Mother's Day, Father's Day, um, can also carry with it um, a, a heaviness and a sorrow uh, as, as some have lost fathers and you, you mourn their loss. And some of those, those wounds are, are very, very recent. Um, one of my best friends growing up buried his father this week. Um, the funeral was on Thursday. And, um, and we know the wards are, are experiencing that as well right now. And, um, and so th- there's, a, there's a joy for some and a, a heaviness for others. And so we're, we're in this together. Let's begin in prayer and then we'll, we'll get into our lesson. Father, thank you for your grace in Jesus. Thank you for your, your grace um, in the little things in our lives and um, the, the blessing of relationships and family. Um, I pray that you will um, be with the wards today as they um, mourn the loss of Linton. Um, I pray that you'll be with the Price family as they uh, mourn the loss of, of Jerry, and there are others who are who are mourning and grieving. There are others that today is is indeed a day of celebration, and may um, uh, fathers feel honored. May they um, uh, be be raised up to to live as as um, you would you would have us to live. And in all things, may we look to you, our Father. Um, who is the source of all life and love and grace and bounty. Um, Thank you for our time together this morning. Thank you for for, um, what you've given us in your people and in the family we can have with one another. Thank you for your scriptures. Um, As we turn our hearts and our minds, uh, may we have ears to hear um, that we would be shaped and changed uh, to live up into your eternal purpose in Jesus and in your church. In Jesus' name. Amen. I want to continue our study um, in Ephesians today. We've been uh, going through this series in Ephesians for the last few weeks. And I want to um, just say at the beginning, if, if uh, you didn't get a chance to hear Tyler's sermon last week, um, please listen to that. Uh, I was, I was, uh, Chels wasn't feeling good last Sunday, so I stayed home to take care of the kids. And so it was Friday before I got a chance to listen to it. And it was excellent. Really good sermon. Um, and if you did listen to it, listen to it again. There was a lot in there. And um, not, just, not just the exposition of Ephesians 4, 1 through 16, but there were some really important things that we as a people need to hear. Um, so that's my plug to, to go um, listen to that sermon again. Um, this will be my last Ephesians sermon. Uh, Tyler will, will conclude our series next week, Lord willing. Um, and so I'll say before I part from Ephesians, I'll ask the same question I've asked the last few weeks. What's God's purpose um, in the world? What what is God working to accomplish in the world? What did Jesus accomplish in his death on the cross? One new humanity in the Messiah, right? That's the language, that's the imagery Paul uses to describe God's eternal purpose in Jesus and in his people. Um, There's neither, in the Messiah, there's neither Jew nor Greek, There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. There's also neither rich nor poor. There's neither black nor white. There's neither Republican or Democrat, American, Mexican, Syrian, Chinese, or any other nationality. Jesus broke down that barrier of the dividing wall. Ephesians 2 makes that abundantly clear. And so we see that all boundaries, all barriers, all borders, all divisions that are based on culture, ethnicity, race, nationality, class, gender, or personal opinions have been broken down once and for all in the Messiah and in his cross. 
And once again, to use John's language, they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, people from every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and you've made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. As we've said throughout our Ephesians study, Paul wants us to grasp and be grasped by the eternal purpose of God in Christ. That's why he talks about knowing so much. He prays in chapter 1 that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of his glory and his inheritance in the saints, what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us to believe. That's why he prays again in chapter 3 that we would know uh, the love of Christ which surpasses surpasses knowledge. And so he spends the first half of this letter leading us through the richest meditation of God's eternal purpose uh, in, in all of Scripture, right? Um, that's an objective, objective uh, verifiable fact. I'll just say it that way. Um, but through, through praise, through prayer, through exposition, Paul helps us to, to step back, to look behind the veil and see who we are and what we have in the Lord, but even more, see who God is, see his work before the foundation of the world. But as we, as we do that, as we step back, as we see that big picture, Right? We, we must understand that this cosmic, this eternal vision for the created world is meant to have visible, tangible, embodied, enfleshed expression. Right? In other words, this is not just a heavenly or spiritual reality. It is that, but it's not just that. Right? And the, the local churches, what, and what, what we see in Ephesians, that local churches are then meant to be a, a microcosm for God's new creation in the Messiah. God is doing something amazing in the world and local churches are to become a small-scale replica and display of that incredible work. Foreshadowed this point a little bit earlier in our series, but now we see it heralded loudly in chapters 4 through 6. And so as we, as we look at 4 through 6, as, as Tyler helped us make that turn last week, uh, the, the therefore at the beginning of, of chapter 4, right? Therefore I, Paul, a prisoner of the Lord... Uh, urge you to walk in a worthy manner or uh, walk worthy of the calling which you've been called right so we're making this turn now um, Paul uh, begins with a with a look at, at the church as a whole um, he, the, the the body the community the family in which we now find our identity our belonging um, our, our our life in Christ uh, and and he he emphasizes throughout that Oneness of the Spirit now is meant to be manifested in our relationships with one another and the way everyone works together and does their part um, for the good and growth of the whole. Right? That was Tyler's sermon last week. That that unity forged by the Spirit that we read about in chapter 2 and chapter 3, now we are meant to, to nurture that in our own relationships with one another and our own working together. But then what we see as we'll, as we'll start to get into chapter, or to verse 17 today, Paul, Paul moves from that group focus to then to focus on the individuals that are going to make up that body or make up that family. And what we see in these verses, what we'll see in these verses is this inside out holistic transformation of every follower of Christ. And, and that, that transformation is just not about me, myself, right? It's a, it's a transformation of every person that would support and nurture nurture this unity or this oneness in the church, and that's in contrast to the corruption that we see in the world, the, 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 the lusts of the, the, the world. And so then before he concludes this, this vision, this practical section in, in 4 through 6, he's going to sow seeds of, of, we could say, revolutionary transformation of a society but he, he looks at the household, right? Uh, wives and husbands, children and parents, slaves and masters. Uh, and and, and what, what we see he, in, in these relationships, in these household relationships, the purposes of God in Christ and in his church, uh, the, the relationship between Christ and his church is manifested in a very special way in the very ordinary, humble relationships that we just mentioned. And so again, looking at Ephesians as a whole, 1 through 3, you see God's purpose. 4 through 6, you see what that looks like in our practice. Practicing, living that out. In 1 through 3, you've got our calling. In 4 through 6, you've got 
the commands that are going to guide and reinforce and, and, and help us live out that calling. Or we could say it this way, in 4 through 6 we see, okay, here's what this looks like on heaven, um, or on, on earth, 1 through 3, as it is in heaven, to, to use the language from the Lord's Prayer. So if you would, open up your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. I want to, I want to go ahead and read um, a large section today. When Paul wrote Timothy, he said, give attention to the reading, the exhortation, and to the teaching. And this morning, I'd like to give a little extra weight than maybe we normally do to the reading. And so we want to read, I want to read all of, at least this body of Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 1 to get a little running start from where Tyler looked at last week, and then um, all the way through the first part of chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 4 beginning in verse 1. I'm reading from the New American Standard. Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There's one body, And one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, when it says, he ascended on high and led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean? Except that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is himself also he ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. Just a side note, right? You notice as you read this letter how obsessed Paul is with Jesus, right? And just captivated by what what God has done in Jesus. And so even when he's making a point, just talking about something that Jesus has done, he can't but help just talk about it a little bit more before he gets back to his main point. Kind of like I just did. Anyway, verse 11. And he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we're no longer children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. So this I say, and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer as the nations walk in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that's in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. But you did not learn Christ in this way. If indeed you've heard him and been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, the old person, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new self, the new person, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor, for we're members of one another. Be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not give the devil an opportunity. He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor performing with his own hands what is good so that he'll have something to share with one who has need. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such is good for edification according to the need so that it will give grace to those who hear. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love 
just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. But immorality or impurity or greed must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. And no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting which are not fitting, but rather giving thanks. For this you know with certainty, that no immoral or impure person uh, or, or covetous person who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of God, kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not be partakers with them, for you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them, for it's disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. But all things become visible when they're exposed by the light, for everything that becomes visible is light. For this reason it says, Awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to God, even the Father, and being subject to one another, in the fear of Christ. Wives to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is head of the church. He himself the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He loves his own wife, loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every man among you see to it that he love his wife as himself, and the wife must see to it that she fears her husband. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in the sincerity of your heart as to Christ, not by way of eye services, men pleasers, but as slaves to Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. With good will, render service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, this he'll receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. And masters... Do the same things to them and give up threatening, knowing that they're both their master and yours is in heaven and there is no partiality with him. All right, I'll by no means attempt to unpack every detail in that reading. Um, but what I want to do this morning is just focus on the, the, the main central idea that's expressed, uh, particularly in chapter 4, verse 17, all the way through chapter 6 and verse 9. And it's this idea of the new life that we now have in Christ. And what he's describing here, as I said a minute ago, is this inside out whole person transformation that we have in Christ by the Spirit, through the Spirit. Okay? So look at verse 17, if you will. Look at the, the, the initial direction. Right? In light of all that he's just said about the unity that we're to, to, to have as a, as a family of God, as the people of God, and, and the, the proper working of each individual part, working together for the growth of the body, for the building up of itself in love. So he says, so this I say, and affirm together with the Lord. It's not just me, Paul, saying this. The Lord's with me in this, right? Stop walking like the world. Right? No longer walk as the Gentiles. Right? They, they, they're, 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 their eyes are darkened. Their hearts are hardened. They've become calloused. You didn't learn Christ in this way. 
What did we learn in Christ? Look at verses 22 through 24. I want to zoom in, especially on this, these verses, because what we see in 22 through 24, this is the pattern for transformation in the Spirit, right? Our part, the, the, the process, the pattern by which we walk by the Spirit and our lives are changed. So he's going to say three things that make up this pattern. Let's listen to verses 22 through 24 again. That in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. All right, do you see the three moves in those three verses, right? There's, there's, there's three components that make up this pattern of transformation. What's the first? put off, right? All right there's, there's this old way of living, this old way of thinking and feeling, old priorities, uh, old values, old desires, right? There's this old way of living that's, that's in accordance with what? Corrupted by what? The lusts of deceit, right? It's this impulsive way of living. It's this selfish way of living. It's this what I feel, what I want, what's about me. He says, put that off and all the things that go along with that. On the other side, you have put on, put on the new self, right? There's a, there's, a, there's a new way of living. There's a new way of thinking. There's a new way of feeling and new values and new priorities and new patterns of life. Put that on, right? And that makes sense, right? If you're going to change, there's some things you've got to stop doing <laughs> that are not good. And there's things you've got to start doing that are, that are good, right? It, you, you, you look at this, just take, a, take something like uh, exercise or, or just overall health, right? If, if you want to go from poor shape to better shape, what do you have to do? You've got to stop trashing your body with junk food and, you know, abusing your body physically. And you've got to start eating healthy and doing some exercise, right? We get that. But is that all that's involved in transformation? Stopping some bad things and starting some good things. What did I skip? There's a step I skip that's in the middle. Put off, put on. But in between that, he says, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Right? So if I'm not convinced that I need to be healthy, right, um, what's going to happen? I'm going to eat pizza day two. Right? You know, and I'll have it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner again. I, I, you know, I, I may have enough strength to, to change a habit for a little bit, but, it's gonna, but there's got to be this, this changing that's happening inside of me at the same time. And, and understand, this is not step one, step two, step three. All right, step one, I've got to stop doing some things and wait a few minutes. And then step two, change my thinking a little bit. Step three, you know, this is, this is like a, a symphony or a concert, right? There's a, there's a flow to it. You know, yeah, there's some things that I put off and simultaneously I'm learning this new way of, of thinking and living and, and it's helping me and guiding me uh, to, to, to these new ways of, of being and acting, right? But, but understand too, sometimes we can live here. We know, I, I can't do that anymore. Yeah, and, and I'm going to do a lot of Bible studies and, and learn a lot here, but never get away, uh, never get around to acting my way into that new life either, right? And, 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 and so the, the, there's all sorts of things we could look at if, if any one of these three pieces are missing, right? It's, it, there's, there's, there's a shallowness to it or a, 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 a lack of power to it or, or, or a lack of richness to it, right? We, we recognize if all I do is stop doing bad things but never get around to putting on good things, that's still not complete, right? That's still not what we're created to be. God didn't create us just to not kill people, Right? He created us to, to be conduits of his grace and his blessing and his love and his life, right? And that's what we're growing up to. So he says, put off this old person, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, right? This, this shallow, false way of living that's all about me and my own impulses. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind and then put on this new self that looks like God. Righteousness, holiness, truth, right? So what Paul goes on to do uh, in the next few verses is he, he models this. He illustrates this for us and looks at just different snapshots of our life. And, and look, you'll see this pattern in, in 25 through 32. Look at verse 25. Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor, for we're members of one another. Do you see the put off, put on, renewal that's going on inside someone? What's the put off? 
lay aside falsehood, right? What's to put on? You speak the truth, right? It, it was helpful for me a long time ago to hear it this way. When's a liar no longer a liar? When he stops lying? Not really. When he starts speaking truth, right? When, when everything you say is true, that builds the, the, the pattern of truthfulness. Look, look at this verse again. What's the, what's the change that's gone, that's, un, that's, that's happened inside someone? For we are members of one another, right? Why do I speak the truth? We're a part of the same family, right? I'm not going to lie to you. I'm going to speak truth to you, right? Because we're members of one another. Verse 26 and 27, be angry and do not sin, right? Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Um, what's the put off there? Right, this sinful anger, what's the put on here? All right, not allowing anger to, to go unchecked, but resolving it quickly. Taking whatever is it you, that you're rightfully angry about and making sure that you act on it quickly. What's the internal change? Do not give the devil an opportunity, right? You, you recognize, okay, we're a part of this, this war that's going on behind the scenes. And when I, act, when, when I allow anger to go unchecked, I'm giving the devil a foothold and a power over me. Look at verse 28. He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor performing with his own hands what is good so that have something to share with the one who has need. What's the put off? Stop stealing. Stop taking. Stop, stop you know, mistreating other people and taking advantage of other people. What's the put on? Work. Be a good worker. Work with your hands to pro provide for yourself and do what? What, what's, the, what's the change that's going on inside of me now that's, that's empowering this new life, right? Look at, look at, again, what he says in verse, verse 28. So that he will have something to share with the one who has need. So instead of living life thinking, what can I take? What can I get? What can I have for myself? I'm now working with my hands and, and doing good so that I can share with people. Why do we work? We can provide for ourselves and so we can share. Right? That's at least where the Lord leads us when, when, when he teaches us to work. Uh, verse 29, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. Right? What's to put off this rotten, garbage, filthy language? What, what's to put on? Only that words that are for edification. Only words that are for edification. Think about that for just a second. We need, we need better filters, I think, sometimes when, when it comes to our language and the way we talk, right? If we could just get j j just a, like a silt trap when you're doing excavating, right? You want to catch all the erosion that's going off. We need a, like a silt trap for our mouths to stop any of the garbage that can come out and think before I say it, is this going to build somebody up? It may be true, but is it going to build someone up? We, we can recognize the difference between destructive truth and constructive truth, right? Truth that tears down and truth that builds up. Only such as is good for edification. Feel the force of that. Only such as is good for edification. And then what's the internal change that's happening? So that it will give grace to those who hear. In Ephesians 1 through 3, Paul has said a lot about grace. He's talked about God's grace being something that's just this rich tre treasure trove. He's just lavished us. He's poured it out on us richly and just lavished us with his grace and his wisdom, right? And now what's he calling us? With our words, we are a conduit. We are a channel. We are a, 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 a yeah, channel for God's grace. We have the op opportunity to impart the same kind of richness and gifting to others with our words. Right? And then he adds this, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Notice how that's linked especially to the way we speak. Grieving the Holy Spirit. 31 and following, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Anything that's going to destroy relationships and erode the unity of the Spirit, put it away. Instead, be kind to one another. Tenderhearted, forgiving each other, right? Even the fact that he says forgiving each other, right? It tells us like there's going to be times when we rub against each other and, and, and there's going to be challenges. If we're doing this right, we're going to have, there are going to be occasions where we need to forgive each other, right? But that's part of the deal. Forgiving each other, what's the internal change? Just as God in Christ 
has also forgiven you, right? And so when we live our lives before the cross and see Jesus on the cross saying, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing, that gets inside of us. And it changes the way we think. And it changes the way we feel and process our own hurts and pains, right? And it's not just a one and done quick fix, right? But we live this life of put off, put on, be renewed in the spirit of our mind. And over the course of our life, the course of time, God changes us. You look at 5, 1, and 2, be imitators of God as beloved children. That's what we're doing, right? We're looking to our Father. We're patterning our lives after Him. We're imitating Him. We're walking in love just as our older brother and our Lord Christ also loved us and gave Himself for us. That's what love is, right? It's giving, giving of ourselves for the good of others, offering and sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Let's look at a, well, I'll, I'll stop there. Let me, let me say this just briefly about seeing this transformation in our household, right? Because, you know, sometimes we'll divide 522 and following into like home and work. But understand in the original context, this was all household, right? Wives and husbands, parents, children, slaves and masters. That's what happens in the household, Look at these relationships and look at how this instruction through Paul and the gospel is, is transforming the household and therefore would transform society from the inside out. Rather than just tearing down institutions or shifting things at that level, he's getting to the wives and he's getting to the husband and he's, and he's giving instructions for their hearts and for their lives. And what have you done to this power structure in the house, right? You've... you've, you've wives are, are, are willingly submitting as they follow the Lord and model the church's allegiance to, the, to Christ. But what's happening to the, to the one who's described as the head, right? Is he this domineering, power-hungry person who just rules over his family? No, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, right? And so notice here how the, the, the wife is taught to look to Jesus, but to look at him on the throne, and that sets the course for her, her life as, as a wife. But look at the husband, and when he's taught how to be a husband and taught how to leave, he looks at Jesus too, but where does he look as for his model of leadership? Jesus on the throne ruling the nations with a rod of iron? No, Jesus on the cross, giving himself completely for the good of those he loves, for the good of his body, his church, his bride. Same thing with slaves and masters, right? You want to disintegrate slavery. Look at how Paul's doing that from the inside out, right? Empowering slaves to, to, to willingly submit rather than just to be forced under, forcefully subjugated. But then look at what he's teaching husbands, or sorry, masters. Man, you have a master. You, you treat, your, treat them well with respect and honor as well. One, one brief disclaimer. So again, what we've pictured here is this new life in Christ that is this inside out, whole person transformation. But understand, uh, it's not always pretty. We, th we read this and think, okay, this new life in Christ is just, if you look at the, the left, uh, it's just this steady incline. We are just growing and growing and growing. But when you, when you like see this played out, it, yeah, there it is, it's right there. Um, right, that's really what it looks like, right? You know, there's ups and downs, there's twists and turns, there's, there's struggles, there's all sorts of hard issues that we're working through, there's baggage that we, we tend to still bring along with us. And so as we go through this course, as we, as we, as we live this life, um, don't, be, um, <clears throat> don't, don't be deceived thinking, all right, well, if, I'm, if I have a struggle or a weakness, I'm doing it wrong. No, no, no. You know, again, that's not a inspired by the Holy Spirit drawing, but I think we recognize uh, how it speaks to our, the reality of our experience. But here's the thing. In all of this, right, we look to the grace of our Father, right? The one who has poured out His grace on us so richly and so lavishly. And we look to the Spirit, to His sanctifying work, so that they accomplish His purposes in and through us each day, right? Every day, we're depending on the grace of God. Sometimes we think, 
it's our, you know, the grace of God was there just to forgive us. But no, no, this new life we live is by the grace of God as well. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we praise you and thank you so much for your rich grace in Jesus. The, the power of his death to cleanse, to forgive, to sanctify, to unify, to transform, to, to bring about such amazing purposes. Um, help us all to be shaped uh, into love, to, to truly love one another, never just as a, as a platitude, as some trivial, trite thing that we say. Um, let it never be this, this just weak love in word only, but may it be a powerful love in, in action, in truth. Um, help us to be here for one another, to, to weep with those who weep, to rejoice with those who rejoice, to bear one another's burdens and fulfill the law of your dear son. Father, help each of us. Give us your spirit. Walk with us. Shape us from the inside out. Um, change our lives all for your honor and your glory that we would be uh, a testament to the manifold wisdom uh, that you have uh, in the world and, and to the, the rulers in the heavenlies as well. Father, we praise you and thank you for Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. If you're with us this morning and you need our prayers for anything, um, struggles in your life uh, or, or just sorrow in your heart, um, in any, any, anything along those lines. We want to pray with you and pray for you. Um, if you're not in Christ and you're ready to give your allegiance to Christ, uh, we wanna, we'd love to baptize you in Jesus today. If there's anything we can do, please come forward as we stand and sing.